นโมทัสสะปะโกวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมบุตสะนโมทัสสะปะโกวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมบุตสะนโมทัสสะปะโกวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมบุตสะ In a few last Dharma talk, we are discussing about four noble truth. The first of the four noble truth is the noble truth of suffering, at which the Buddha said, "One must thoroughly understand it. That truth, we must really thoroughly understand it." In his first sermon. He opened as thus. Okay. Birth is suffering. Old age and decay is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, and grief is suffering. Being with person of dislike is suffering. Being apart from person that you like is suffering. Not attaining one, what one wishes, in here is, which is unattainable, is suffering. In brief, five aggregates of clinging is suffering. So, those are the suffering. As a definition for the noble truth of suffering, and we have discussed all these in details. The last one, the five aggregates of clinging. That is the the main point, the key point in this, the first noble truth, because that is. A walking model. Start. So the five aggregate of clinging is one is aggregates of materiality or rupa. Okay. Aggregates of feeling and sensations vedana. Aggregates of perception sanya. And aggregates of mental formation, sankara, and aggregates of consciousness, which is v i j a n a Those are the five aggregates. And we have talked lengthily so that now we understand. This five aggregates of cleaning is anything and everything of the world of. Living beings, anything and everything in the universe of living beings. That is, what's about. And we have discussed in at length. Now we intellectually and philosophically understand what the noble truth of suffering is. In short, what suffering is, we have discussed about it. And as I have said, the last one is the most important one among all the suffering because it covers anything and everything. And also, it becomes a walking model for the release from suffering. Why has it become a working model? So, what are we practicing? What are we doing? Okay, to be able to eliminate all physical and mental suffering. We are practicing, or we are doing vipassana, insight meditation. Of course, we follow the. Pure vipassana root, in other words, 
we practice vipassana using satipatthana as a tool, foundation of mindfulness as a tool, or in other words, pure vipassana. We practice vipassana. So, in a very precise way, what do we do when we practice vipassana? What we do is we observe the five aggregates. That's it. Vipassana is observing five aggregates. And what is five aggregates? Five aggregates are is suffering. Five aggregate is life. Five aggregates is what we call existence of a being. So That's what Vipassana does, or that's what we are doing. We are observing the five aggregates. How do we observe? We observed at every present moment, any and every present moment, whatever aggregates that is arising at that moment, we observed it. And we know how to observe precisely and correctly. So we won't go into it. We observe whatever aggregates that is arising at the present moment with precision and correctness. Vipassana. By observing, what do we do? We are observing suffering. And why are we observing suffering? so that we can experientially know what suffering is, what dukkha is, what the first noble truth is, to thoroughly understand. We already understood intellectually and philosophically. Now we are doing vipassana so that we can experientially understand what dukkha is what the first noble truth is. That's what we are doing. So, as the five aggregates is anything and everything, and as we are observing the five aggregates, we don't say we are observing this aggregate or that aggregate, because those encompass everything. So, Whatever is arising at the moment, you just simply observed. If you feel the tension, observe the tension. If you feel the stiffness, observe the stiffness, or hot or cold. If you feel any sensations, pleasant or unpleasant, observe it. And if you feel any emotional states, observe it. So when you're observing this hot and cold and hard and soft and tension and things, that is observing the aggregates of the body. Rupakanda, you're observing it. So but we don't say, I'm observing Rupakanda. You simply observe exactly what that specific object arising at that moment. Rupakanda. You are observing Rupakanda. And also, mostly in our path with the Satipatthana method, pain, unpleasant sensation is the most prominent. That's the way it's structured. The reason it's structured in such a way is what we really want to know is dukkha, suffering. And the obvious way to understand dukkha is to go straight into the pain. Because pain, every one of us agree this is suffering. That's why we go right into that unpleasant sensation. So observe the pain. And then, of course, we know when you reach to a certain level, you experience pleasant sensations. 
and also at the higher level neutral sensation. Whenever you are observing these sensations, you are observing the Vedana Khanda, aggregates of feeling. You observe that. And then the third aggregate, the third aggregate is called Sanya Khanda, okay, aggregates of perception. And in here is not straightforward, not straightforward, because observed <coughs> Sanya Khanda aggregates of perception. Because perception, in a strictest sense, you simply cognize certain marks or characteristics <coughs> of that object so that you always can recall or remember that object whenever <coughs> you come face again. So that perception could be right one or the wrong one and the wrong it could be exactly its true nature through that nature you cognize and you perceived or you could cognize and received which is not in accordance or which is not the true nature. If it is not the true, it is the false nature to coin a word. You perceive through a and whether we cognize it, remember it, perceived it. The mark memory that way. That is perception. It it could be right or wrong. So in here, to put it in a different way, when you perceive it as it really is, you can call it samadhi. <coughs> the correct view, the right view. When you perceived not according to its true nature, you can call it deity. If you want to follow what mecha deity, you perceived it wrongly. So perception could be sama deity or mecha deity. It could be. But we cannot be observing in the dual way. So when we observe this sanya, you don't and we don't observe directly. Okay? We observe indirectly. Whenever you are cognizing and remembering okay, an object, it could be physical marks that you made with some physical aspect, physical mark. It could be the sensation that you try to associate and remember with based on your experiences. Or it could be with the emotional factors that you associate with. So whenever you are observing the physical marks or the feelings and sensations or the emotionals or formations, mental formations, which are associated with your perception, then it is correcting your wrong perception into the right perception. <clears throat> In a different way, how do you do that? How is perception is replaced with a proper technique of perceiving, which is mindfulness. Mindfulness, we it's perception, it perceived, but it perceived according to its true nature as it really is. That's why the Buddha taught us this mindfulness. 
so that whenever we perceive something, it is always in accordance with the, the true nature as it really is. How do you do? You observe all these physical marks of physical aggregates, marks of feeling aggregates, marks of formation aggregates that are mingled or mixed with your perception. How do you do that? As soon as you take the mindfulness in, as soon as you pre- replace mindfulness with this in place of sanya, what happens is it eliminates the likes and dislikes. It eliminates loba and dosa. Okay? In other words, you don't look at it with favoritism or prejudice. You don't look at it with partiality. You look at it impartially. And also, you know exactly what is happening. That is how mindfulness cleaned out the perception sanya. So whenever you perceive something with mindfulness, automatically you are observing the true nature of the object that is arising at the moment. So one should understand that is the aggregates of clinging. But in the foundation of mindfulness, we don't say perception. Okay, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of the feeling, mindfulness of the formations, and mindfulness of the consciousness. We don't say sanya. The reason is sanya is automatically replaced by mindfulness. Mindfulness is also perception, but it's every time. Because of the technique, because of the method, because how the Buddha taught us, it is always identical of the true nature of the object. That's how it is. So we're observing this, and also formation. Formation we already know. What is formation? Formation or sankara, the mental formation. Formation is what is for formation is making it, making it or forming it, forming something, making something. That is formation. Forming. Formation, sankara. You're always creating something. You're always making up something. You're make, always. Okay. Making something. There is the will involved. Without willingness, Without the will, you won't make anything, you won't form anything. Only when you have a will to do it, you are making something, you are forming something. When you have a will to go to downtown Vancouver on a sunny day, when you have a desire, when you have a will, you somehow make it to get to downtown Vancouver and do whatever you desire or your will to do. So every sankara or every formation, there is always a will. Will, volition, or jitana. Jitana, there's always that. That jitana itself is the one of the Sankara Kanda, aggregates of formation. But in every, every formation, every making process, that will is involved. The will, the desire. Because of that, 
something is made, something is formed, something is created. That is how it happens. So whenever you are observing Panda, okay, you are observing it, and based on the direction of the will, intent of the will, and purity or impurity of the will, things will be forming successively one after the other. And whenever you are observing a sense of awareness of objects, you are observing your consciousness. So those are the things you are all the time observing the five aggregates, because that is the job of Vipassana. So whenever you are observing the five aggregates, what are you observing? You are observing, or you are experiencing, or you are knowing suffering, because five aggregates is suffering. Suffering is five aggregates. Every time you are observing any one of the five aggregates, you are understanding dukkha. You are understanding the first noble truth. Of course, not with clarity, not with concept. You don't come into a big picture with intellectual construction. But you are experiencing, experiencing, experiencing. Every time you are observing, you are experiencing dukkha. So that's how five aggregates come into the first noble truth, and that's how vipassana come into the walking model. You observed. Okay, let's say we observe. When we observe, let's take an example. Okay. Suddenly you are observing as usual, and there is a, a thought arises which happened a day ago, a week ago, which really provoked you and you got really tested, angry. Okay. When you got angry at that moment, what happened? Because of that anger, you couldn't hold your tongue or you couldn't hold which one shouldn't do. You say something that shouldn't, you did something that you shouldn't, but that is the anger. And then because of the consequences, you pay the price or minimal, you feel bad. That is, a week ago it happened. That is suffering because of the unmindful, nature or heedless nature of the situation, not mindful, not heedless of the situation. And you are meditating and suddenly that anger thought arises again and the anger arises again. As soon as the anger arises, but this time as you are meditating, you have that Mindfulness momentum is on your side. Because of that, you can observe that anger. You become aware of that anger quite quickly. And as soon as you become aware of that anger quite quickly, what happens is anger is already starting to work its own. It's gear. Suddenly, your muscles are tense, your fist a little tightened, your jaw a little tightened, and your heart racing faster because anger takes control. Just drive at its own lane, that's what happened. And suddenly, mindfulness comes in and you become aware. When you become aware, what do you do? You observe the manifestation of the anger, let's say on a physical level, or you observe the anger itself, if you catch it fast enough. And as soon as you observe it, what happened? All these physical manifestations, first of all, 
decrease its momentum, and then finally disappear. The anger also disappear. And because of that, you do not have any uncomfortable, dissatisfied situation in you anymore. Because that suddenly disappear. So that is the experience of your meditation. We are spotlighting on this one. You can take every instance in that nature. And as soon as it disappear, and not only once, not only twice, you've been experiencing many times and many situations, and suddenly you realize, you realize there, before I suffer, whenever that ang- anger comes up, it suffers. When you are not meditating, that situation is so bad, whenever you think about it, you become really angry again. Of course, when you are angry, you personalize it and you just go straight onto that person in your mind and cursing and shifting and do this, do that. They are wrong. That is how it goes. Because you grasp onto that situation. You hold onto that situation. You become attached to that situation, which means you grasp that anger. You hold on that anger. You become attached to that anger. Amazingly, we become attached to the anger, which we don't want it, but still we attach to the anger. Because of that attachment, that anger arises again and again, and very uncomfortable, unpleasant feelings and thought and cursing to that person arise again and again and again. Because we grasp onto it, we can attach to it. But in your meditation, as soon as mindfulness comes in, that anger, that thought, is viewed totally on an impartial level, without likes and dislike. You view it exactly as it is, as it is anger. This is a tightening of the muscle. This is the jaw grinding. You observe it, and then everything simply dissolves. Why? At the moment of your observation, you are impartial, which means you don't have likes and dislikes. Okay? You don't have likes and dislikes. You don't have prejudice. What it means is you don't have attachment. When you don't have no likes and no dislikes, you do not have attachment to the object. You don't have grasping onto that object. You don't have holding onto that object. You don't become attached to that object. That is our personal experience. And I'm sure everyone who is sitting here have one time or the other have experienced many a time. So let's look at it. The first time before on a normal state, we are attached, we grasp, we hold on to that condition, situation, and we suffer. And when you are observing with mindfulness, you can observe the object objectively, which means you don't have any attachment. You don't have any grasping onto that condition or to the sensations, or to the anger. At that moment, no suffering arises anymore. That is our personal experience. Before we attach, we are tortured by the same thought again and again. When we become, when we become, when we are able to observe the same condition, the same anger with mindfulness, it becomes detached. Detached attitude is established. 
as soon as detached attitude is established, there is no more suffering. In fact, don't even know where it is gone. You move on to another, rising, falling, or and so on and so on. That is our personal experience. That grasping, that attachment creates suffering. Without that grasping, without that attachment, there is no suffering. Moment to moment experience. And this attachment, this grasping, in Pali is called Tana. Okay, English translated as craving. Tana. Tana or craving is the cause. Suffering is the effect. And we just talk about two, three minutes based on our own personal experience. And that's what Buddha said, the second noble truth. Craving is the cause and suffering is the effect. Tatna is craving is the cause, and dukkha is the effect. Cause and effect. In other words, the Buddhists point out the origin of suffering. The origin of suffering is attachment, craving. Craving and attachment is the cause. Suffering is the effect. So, that's how the Buddha taught us the second noble truth. The second noble truth, the origin of suffering, or the genesis of suffering, or the beginning of suffering, that is craving. Craving is the cause, suffering is the effect. But what is suffering? Suffering is the five aggregates. Craving is the cause. Five aggregates is the effect. And what is five aggregates? Five aggregates is this mind and this body. Craving is the cause. Mind and body is the effect. What is this mind and body? It is a self, a person, you, me, I, a living being. Craving is the cause. Becoming a living being is the effect. How does a living being arise? It has to be born. Craving is the cause. Rebirth is the effect. Of course, when Buddha taught us, not people like us, he talked to the very people who are very already quite enlightened with great intellectuals, great wisdom. So brief and short, but throughout the century, all the great teachers have explained to us in many ways. Now we come to understand in many different ways. So each one can understand. But we must understand in such detail if we want to understand what suffering is and how craving and sufferings are connected, how the first noble truth and the second noble truth are connected. At such a we must understand craving is the cause, suffering. And through the connection I have shown Craving is the cause. Rebirth is the effect. Rebirth. That's how you go round and round in the cycle of birth and death and birth and death and birth and death. Sansara. Craving is the main driver. Craving is the cause. So the Buddha said, craving, this craving or this dana. D-A-N-H-A, Tanna. This craving, this Tanna. Okay. This 
hunger and thirst. Buddha used the word thirst and hunger. Thirst and hunger, or this craving. Thirst and hunger, or this craving, is the one that created rebirth. Craving, the second noble food. This one which created rebirth. So in here, the Buddhism go totally different from the rest of the concepts or the ideas or beliefs of philosophy of genesis of living beings. Or you want to go precise word genesis of human being. But in Buddhism, Humans and all other livings are the same. Living being is a living being. It's just a matter of a different setting, different conditions, different. The genesis of human being or living beings are that they are involved with creators. Okay, some are with creators, some with the um, or whatever one perceived to be, but it's always created. That is the origin of human or living beings. The genesis of human or living beings created. But in Buddhism, nothing is created. Everything is through cause and effect. And if you want to call it the creator of living beings, it's that craving, that thirst, that hunger. That is the one that created living beings, that's the one that created rebirth. Okay. And this craving is bound up, intertwined, mixed together, inseparable with pleasure and lust. This craving is inseparably bound up with pleasure and lust. And this craving takes the lights in here and there. How the Buddhists talk about the second noble truth. Okay. You become that rebirth is caused by craving. And it is always bound up with pleasure and lust. The second noble truth. So what does it mean by this rebirth, 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 life, 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 we make? That one is a proof. Of course, until and unless one have practiced and attained a certain mental state, a okay, higher degree of concentration, that's different. But all of us have been reached to that level. So we do not have the direct proof that the past life exists or next life exists. We don't have that. So to speak, we have to take Buddhist word faith. Okay, that is rebirth. I'm going now scientifically. We do not have it at this stage. But there are so many things that is happening in the world under our nose, which support this theory of rebirth. We all know about the prodigy. Okay, the kids, or the child is only about four, five, six years old. You can play music like the grandmaster. There are some children, not even teens. They are mathematical genius. They are at the PhD level. That kind of a thing. few years old, they can sit down and meditate like a monk who has been practicing for 20, 30, 40 years. 
persistently and consistently. Where does it come from? Everything has to have a cause and effect. They do not have any environment or condition or time to practice these things, to learn this thing, but regardless, it is with them. So the only logical answer is they must have a certain time period, a certain space and time that they have been practicing and practicing and learning and learning a lot. For a four to six years old, which one is that? It's definitely past lives. That kind of support we can draw in and see that to prove indirectly that rebirth or past life and future life exist. There are some cases, okay, there's one documented one. Um, a man, uh, a, a child born in the lower part of Burma. When he was born, he has a big, big scar on his back. No, I don't know, but the parents love the child and they brought him up. When he got older and older, when you have enough common sense, what he said is, I want to go home. I want to go home. No, you are at home. No. And that child, to make the long story short, give exactly, no, I live, I have a family, I have a wife, I have children, I live in such and such place, what such and such time, this village, and so on. And I was just trading, in those olden days, you have trading with a little, um, not a motor boat, this is about uh, 100 years old. So, with a boat coming down the stream, and the a gang of robbers rob all his goods. He's a merchant. And they cut him with their sword and kill. And that big scar is exactly where it was cut. So he keeps saying that, and finally the parents gave up, and okay, to keep the kid shut up. So they actually traveled to exactly what the kid said, and they found exactly it was there. There was a man who lived there. They have the family of the children, everybody. Now they are a lot older, of course, than this kid. And it was traveling on his uh, trading downstream in the Ayurveda River. He was robbed and killed. And these kind of things, there are many, many documents, not only in Burma, in the West too, in the East, in the Middle East, everywhere. Somehow or something, these kind of stories come up. So from these stories, which are quite easy to prove. Rebirth exists, past life exists, and future life exists. But at the same time, if you practice okay, meditation to a higher degree in a jhanic level, you can accurately recall your past life. While I was young, I was quite curious about these things. And I met a man who he can recall 40 of his past life. And there's no reason for me not to believe him. He's a rich man. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't even have family anymore in a big house. He lived by himself every day. All that he do is meditate. He doesn't want a name, he doesn't want a fame, he doesn't talk with anybody, he simply meditates and lives. For some reason I got connected and that's a story I know. He doesn't need to impress just a little kid. He's a teenager who is exploring and I truly believe him. There are many instances of course. So there are people if you practice samatha meditation and if you get to a certain jhanic level you can have that power to recall past and for him is as clear as day and night and also in vipassana meditation some of the yogis not everybody especially with people with some parami from the past and which 
in turn supports what you are practicing now. Recall some past life. How do you know? Of course, we don't know. But whenever you call, it is just like a, you see something. You see something in your mind eye as if you are looking at me and I'm looking at you. That's number one in a real, like let's say virtual reality, that kind of thing. And in a place and a time that you never imagined exists with details. Those kind of things happen quite often and there are many reports in the meditation center as well. So the point I'm making is there may be people who argue. Maybe life exists, it doesn't exist, and so on and so forth. Rebirth. How do we know? The Buddha is very clear. Craving is called rebirth. is Not only this, there are many lives you have lived in the past and many lives you are going to live on as long as you live in this system that creates the cycle of birth and death, which is craving. So that is a revert. So that is how we can indirectly prove that previous life exists and future exists. And that is... There's a craving sense pleasure, craving for sense pleasure. That's one type of craving. And another type of craving is craving for the wrong view. Craving for the wrong view. The wrong view is one is the craving for the wrong view of eternalistic view, which means some of the people in the world believe we have a, a soul or a spirit, indestructible, lives forever for eternity. Okay? It cannot be destroyed, it is eternal. That is the eternalistic view. And these soul or spirit, they have to walk their way up. In other words, they will have to cleanse themselves. And eventually, you evolve upward, 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 and eventually you become one with thee. You can call it a creator, or you can call it a um, universe, or you whatever. There are many words coined. You believe there is one eternal place, and you are walking towards it. And that one soul is eternal and gold. That's the eternalistic view. That is one view. And another one is called Anela Hills. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce correctly. Anela view, I believe. In other words, this is the only life one's have. There's nothing before. And once you die, there's nothing after that kind of a view. So people hold on to that view, crave for the eternalistic view. And some people crave and hold on to this only one life view. With those kind of three cravings, we live. And as long as we hold on these three cravings, but actually, two, one, you crave onto sense pleasure, two, you crave onto the wrong view. As long as you craving, you will be always reborn in this cycle of birth and death. In other words, this birth, birth is suffering, old age is suffering, death is suffering. If there's a birth, there will be old age, decay, and death, suffering. So craving is the cause. Suffering is the effect. Craving is the cause. Rebirth is the effect. 
the second noble truth. So we touch uh, a bit of what the second noble truth is. Uh, and then next talk, we'll go more detail into about this craving or tanna or attachment, the second noble truth, or the origin of suffering. May all of you be able to understand the full noble truth theoretically as well as experientially, and may you be able to release yourself from all form of suffering as soon as possible. Sadhu, 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 buddham bhujemi, dhammam bhujemi, Sangam Pujimi.